Hello and thank you for downloading our history programme Witness on the BBC World Service with me, Rachel Gilman. Today I'm taking you back to January the 12th, 2003 and to the US city of Chicago. The state's governor announced that four men living on death row had been pardoned. They had been victims of police torture to make them confess to crimes they hadn't committed. But they weren't the only victims of the city's police department. In the 70s and 80s, police commander John Burge ran the Area 2 section of the Chicago Police Department on the south side of the city. Burge was a decorated war veteran and had a high profile. He became very, very well known and was promoted very quickly from detective to sergeant to lieutenant to commander because he was successful in getting confessions. He was successful in uh, sending people to jail and uh, many people he also was uh, instrumental in sending to death row. Flint Taylor is a lawyer at the People's Law Office in Chicago and has represented many victims of police torture in the city. Back in the early 80s, many US politicians were focused on bringing crime rates down. It was in this political landscape that Burge and his team of white detectives became well known particularly uh, under the Nixon administration and then later under the Reagan administration, there was what they called a war on crime, which later became a war on drugs, which really was a war on the black community. With the exception of one or two of the now 125 people that we've uh, documented, all African-American men, uh, men who were brought in primarily on serious crimes, although some of them were witnesses uh, rather than suspects. Uh, others were just brought in in dragnets. And, of course, Daryl can tell you in more detail the uh, horrendous torture that he was subjected to by two of Burge's right-hand men. November the 2nd, 1983, was my first encounter with these sadistic individuals And it's a day that will always live in my mind as long as I'm alive. Daryl Cannon was a young black man living on the south side of Chicago. He had previously been convicted of a murder and had spent 12 years in jail for the crime. He was out on parole when Burgess men came for him, a fact that Cannon thinks made him an easy target. They had received information that I had knowledge of this particular murder. And once they found out that I was on parole, then okay. Anything they do to me, who's going to believe it? Because of the fact that I'm an ex-convict, still out on parole, and now my name has came up. To them, the deck was already stacked against me. And so they invaded my apartment one morning. About 18 detectives, no, no police officers, detectives, with shotguns, automatic weapons. They kicked in the door. Having been driven to the police station, instead of being given access to an attorney there, Cannon was soon put back in the car and taken to an isolated area of Chicago. We left the police station and from about 7.15 in the morning until after 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I was in their possession. And they kept me away from the police station so that no attorney could get to me until they were finished with me. They did despicable things to me that you would not uh, phantom detectives doing to any alleged suspect. Uh, During the day, they beat me on my knee with a huge flashlight. Uh, They got me out the car, and I was handcuffed behind my back. They then played a game uh, called Russian Roulette, but they played it with a shotgun. They did this mock roulette three separate times on me, and the third time they did it, in my mind, when I heard the click of that shotgun, I honestly thought he was blowing the back of my head off because the hair stood up on the back of my head. They didn't stop there. They then placed me in the back seat of a detective car, and they turned me sideways. One of the detectives came around to the back side of uh, the detective car, reached in, t- had me to put my hands up in the air, which was cuffed in front of me, and he pulled the cuffs. And this is when they pulled my pants and shorts down, and they proceeded to lecture shock me over and over again uh, on my genitals. It was ridiculous. It was something that, to this day, I, I still do not understand how individuals could be so sick and sadistic. 
after enduring this mental and physical abuse, Cannon falsely confessed to a murder he had not committed. I finally gave in and told them that I was willing to sign anything they wanted me to. Uh, at that point, if they would have said, OK, your mother committed this murder and we want you to sign an affidavit, I would have done so. I would because of the fact that the torture that I endured uh, still lives with me today continuously. And sometimes I get so mad that I start crying. And I have to tell people that I'm not crying because I'm hurting. I'm crying because I'm just that mad. I never got a chance to defend myself, uh, to take uh, some action against what they were doing to me. After Cannon's confession, he appeared in court the next day and was charged with murder. It was only at this point that he was able to tell his attorney exactly what had happened to him, and the attorney immediately asked him to draw pictures of the abuse. I said, I don't, I'm not an artist. He said, I don't care. You mean some stick figures, something that I can take in court and show. So that's what I did. I drew torture drawings of everything they did to me, where they took me, uh, the area, the torture itself. Despite the only evidence against him being his confession under torture, Cannon was sentenced to life in prison. The judge who sentenced him was familiar with Commander Burge and the Area 2 Department. I was placed before a judge who used to be an ex-prosecutor at Area 2 who knew the particular detectives involved. He precluded my attorneys from being able to cross-examine these particular detectives in front of a jury. Uh, in his words, that it had no redeeming value uh, to bring that up, yet and still, this was the entire case. I had no single individual come in court and testify against me. There wasn't a thread of evidence against me, nothing but the torture confession itself. Years later, when this case was reopened again by the Office of Professional Standards, um, they had an investigator by the name of Veronica Tillman. She took the torture drawings and she went out to the area where I had described. And at that point, she called forensics to come out and take pictures. And it was exactly like I had drew it uh, some years earlier when I was tortured. In all, Daryl Cannon spent 24 years in maximum security prisons. During that time, evidence against Burge and his men was mounting. In 1991, he was suspended and he was finally fired two years later after a review found that the Area 2 department had used torture to force confessions. Daryl Cannon wasn't released until 2007. I can be extremely stubborn at times that I refuse to, to let go anything. And I knew in my mind that I had an uphill battle, but I never thought for one moment that I would be in prison for the rest of my life. None of the police involved were ever charged. It was judged that according to the Statute of Limitations, the crimes had happened too long ago. However, in 2010, John Burge was convicted of obstruction of justice and perjury for lying about the torture in a civil lawsuit, and he was sentenced to over four years in jail. The city of Chicago has paid out millions in reparations to the victims of police torture. Chicago's children learn about the scandal as part of the school curriculum and a public memorial to commemorate the victims is on display in the city. Daryl Cannon and Flint Taylor were speaking to me, Rachel Gilman, for Witness. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.